Hello and welcome to part six, section B. And well, the last one was over an hour long, so hopefully this one's going to be quicker. I'm going to uh, to do that. I'm going to not talk for so long. But please do remember to like, share, and subscribe if you're enjoying these. That I think I'm going to be doing more in the future, and also. The vote is open on the Patreon account for the patron selections for September. So if you want to choose, please become a patron. Go click. And remember, patrons suggest these topics, and then patrons get a vote on which ones get to be done. So, enjoy. And if you've got Britain and the Netherlands at war with the Japanese, mm -hmm. now he, I, I, I've never quite worked out what his views on the French were, but um, he certainly appeared to have these bizarre notions that Britain and Scandinavia and the Netherlands were somehow Aryan brothers of this bizarre concept of he certainly Rachel does like to try and talk about that phraseology, yes. Yeah. Um, so he he would have... Um, it, it would have been a way for him to try and get them on side and maybe create more of a breach between them and Poland. And then, yes. And, and distract them that way. Because, you know, the reason for going to war with France... Well, actually, he didn't necessarily want to go to war with France. He wanted to go east. Yes. He turned west because we kind of forced him to, and he needed to sort out the West so we could concentrate on the East. But he always wanted to go East. Mm -hmm. um, he always wanted Libertron. He wanted lots of things. Um, I recently watched or listened to a podcast things by people saying he's not mad, he wasn't mad. Um, no, he wasn't. He was, unfortunately, he was... He was a S-H-I-T. He was... I think he... Probably many, perhaps. many things, but I don't... Uh, at the beginning... I think it was I'm personality mad. disordered. Not mad. There's a very, very marked difference. Um, I think he had a personality disorder. I haven't quite worked out which one, because I'm far from a psychiatrist. But, yeah. Um, anyway. We've drifted off topic again. And uh, Yes, we have, but we're sort of we're, we're skirting bit. around the topic. So... Huh. We're not quite sure how they've achieved control, but they have. And let's say in the Christmas of 1938, so it's not yeah. too long ago, they have managed to get power. It, um, it's, it's a swing on the back of the uh, 1938 uh, midterm elections that actually FDR did quite badly in. Yeah. Um, uh, in in real life, um, he, he, his his son, his uh, policies Didn't they that... hold a huge, massive rally in in New York at some point in this period? The uh, the Ameri uh, the American equivalent of a Nazi party. Um, <coughs> they hold on, math. When they call the American Union of Fascists and <coughs> I don't know. Something um, or honestly, I don't know because I don't care that much about them. Because yeah. we're just uh, we're, yes. look, we have to come with a plausible reason for how um, why America would actually come in on the side of Japan, and this was the only as we said. It was this small group of really annoying people get supported by alien space bats. Yeah. The, the key thing here is alien space bats and then a lot of Americans... Get mind-washed by sonic waves. Yeah. So, and, and you know, if, you want, if, if they need a casus belly, then if they continue trying to trade with Japan... They are going to run into British and Bar British Ed and yes. Bar. So and the, yeah, British are probably going to start impounding ships. Yeah, or at least trying to turn them around, and then probably impounding them if they continue on, and then they'll go to Admiralty courts and they'll dispute the decisions. Yeah, or Britain might. You see, the thing is, Britain would probably do what it did in the First World War and had done in the Napoleonic Wars, which is capture the ship. Buy the cargo, send the ship back. Yeah. And the, the thing is, most neutrals 
were prepared to accept that. If you d- if you get pissed off with it, though. Mm. So now, or if there are some Japanese sailors or something trying to get home from uh, home from America on uh, from their Japanese ships on American ships, and Britain stops it, rather like what happens with Germany in the Asamoah incident, yes. where uh, the British and almost end up at war again with Japan in another time, ni- January 1940. Yeah. So we have war. Yeah. We have war. Now, the fun part. How is it going to go? What's going to happen? Well, it all depends on how quickly the Ger- the Americans end up joining the war. Um, my fear and where they sort of their fleet. If they to if they send their fleet to Hawaii, their mass fleet to Hawaii, which I think they would have done after their exercise, because let's say they still have the same big fleet exercise, mm. and it it's probably not going to happen within minutes or within days we're probably talking two to three months into the war so we're probably talking april time maybe before there's been the big battle let's say with the japanese Mm. now the interesting thing is going to be what do the germans and italians do do they declare war immediately or do they go neutral (sighs) Uh, my suspicion would be with Hitler and his eyes to the prize and is always gambling, especially considering the condition of the US Navy versus the Royal Navy. And yes, the Royal Navy has been at war for three months and its crash building program won't have started to play fruition yet, but it will be doing a crash building program. And does does America invade Canada straight off? Now, the thing is, if I've got America uh, the the other thing is, it, it, if it's to get to the Pacific, it's going to take me three months to start to mobilise Canadian troops, really, to get them out for the Pacific War, because they are all trained and equipped for a different type of fighting. So before I start bringing them, I'm going to be training and quicking them up in, in, North, in Canada. And I'm probably going to be making orders to North America, a still, because that's where it's got the factories to build them, but they're not going to have started delivering yet, which is going to be interesting. But what happens then is, did the Americans invade Canada? Well, do the Americans have enough army to do that in early 1939? Not really. I mean, they can try it. Yeah. But the trouble is, again, you're looking at, you're talking about sort of, let's say they're doing this in April 1939. They haven't got, now yes, it's coming into summer, so it's the best season for it. But the Canadians are going to be mobilized for the last three months. There are going to be quite, a, all those big harbor targets, which are tar- uh, targets of war plan. I think it's red. That's the one about going into Canada. Yeah. Um. Halifax, etc., are going to have garrisons on alert. So that's not going to be an easy operation, especially if your major fleet is sitting in the Pacific. So you might have a go at Vancouver, but having a go at Halifax, your fleet is in the wrong ocean. Yeah. Now, the, the US Navy at this stage, from what I can tell, from uh, a couple of places that kind of try and give you an idea. Yeah. There's a, there's a nice website called fleetorganization.com mm-hmm. who has an order of battle for the US Navy from the fir- for the 1st of October 39. I believe the author of the site uh, kind of found a record of that and so decided to turn it all into everything. And then you can get some stuff from the... Um, nav webs and uh, uh, navalhistory.net um, but but it, it, it's not the easiest thing and the US Navy at this stage is really confuses me about how it's organized because they have the submarine force the battle force the scouting force and an Atlantic squadron um, but they have two oceans to look after now the Atlantic Squadron 
is not looking like an A team, if I'm being brutally honest. No. Your, your, your Atlantic squadron, on its own, if the entire battle force and scouting force have just finished their uh, fleet problem in the Caribbean and gone through the Panama Canal, uh, you've got Bat Div 5, uh, which is a one Wyoming class battleship, mm -hmm. which has 12, 12 inch guns, and two New York class battleships with their five twin 14 inch guns, which are capable of racing along at a whole 20 knots, maybe. You've got the USS Ranger which will be equipped with advanced fighters like maybe the F3F biplane predecessor to the uh, Wildcat, but quite possibly the F2F, which was the predecessor to that one. Mm -hmm. And they are not yet going to have fully converted to that wonderful thing, the Hell Diver or the Devastator torpedo and dive bombers. Those wonderful mm -hmm. things from Midway yeah haven't yet even really fully entered service they're still with the generation before even that yeah and that's in october yeah so let's be honest in april yeah and this is this and is kind of the rump fleet this is this is the afterthought fleet from what i can tell and again they'll be facing against the afterthought fleet of britain what's left behind which is going to be some r's hms yep. furious I reckon it's four or five R's, and um, you've got um, now. Uh, sorry, I did just scribble this down. You and the other thing is, you will have had Renown was in refit, but now in in reality, she came out of refit in August thirty nine. Yep, but if I'm at war, starting in January nineteen thirty nine, I think I can pull that forward a bit. Yep, because I will be um, cranking double shifts to get her out. Yeah, and you've also got two of the Queen Elizabeth class in refit at this stage, both Queen Elizabeth herself and Valiant. And again, that may be foreshortened. So you've suddenly got... And there's two more carriers which are coming up, which are commissioned in 1940, technically. But um, let's be honest, you would be cracking on if you're in a war. Yeah, so, so the RN can put together a pretty decent force. And Maybe not exactly in April 1939, uh, uh, but they've got enough to hold. Uh, the trouble is they've got quite a large fleet sitting in the Pacific. Yep. Uh, the American and Japanese Navy combined are bigger than it, but... Can they work together? That's going to be, be an interesting thing. Can they work together? Two is, has the Royal Navy already beaten the Japanese already smashed or... the Japanese heavy units because let's be honest April it's getting close yeah I reckon by April I reckon they might have smashed them before the Americans could realistically have formed up and got across the Pacific because the Americans would realistically it's going to be a couple of weeks so let's say they're going to get there mid-May and that could give the Royal Navy enough time to smash the Japanese and rearm and get ready and remember this is the navy which prefers night ambush tactics for its air attacks yeah before radar mm -hmm. it's fitted to almost anything mm -hmm. um and and yes it yeah. didn't go that well against operation c because the um attack went the wrong direction but then you have a very tired Somerville in charge. The officers you'll have had in charge in the Pacific, in a China station fleet at this point, under this scenario, A, I think, whatever, how, I think you would have had a Supreme Commander sent out, but uh, leaving that to one side, uh, even if you hadn't, the people you've got in charge out there are the ones who managed to organize Toronto. Uh, they managed to get a fairly novice lot of flyers, I think, to hit um, Bismarck yeah. moving during daylight. You've got Arc Royal, you've got Courageous, you've got Glorious. 
So you've got they, three fairly decent sized carriers along with some more interesting style carriers. Yes. Um, it was an interesting time. It was a bit like the um, French pre dreadnoughts. Mm hmm. Lots of interesting designs. Lots so, of learning from experience. Yeah. Uh, it's the question of, it's not the question of, are the American aircraft better than the British aircraft? They're about the same at this point. But the British aircraft will be used at a time when the American aircraft aren't going to be airborne. Yeah. And you, again, you've got war seasoned Brits against. Who've Nords. had a couple of months of fighting. Yeah. Against Americans who. Have had a jolly good exercise, but that's a very different experience. Yeah. They haven't pulled the trigger on somebody who at, might actually be shooting back. And, and the interesting thing is it would be the submarine war, because again, the Royal Navy's anti submarine warfare arm is, is definitely stronger than the Japanese anti submarine warfare arm. That's not hard. And the American submarines are not, again, not at the, the early war submarines are not as good as their later war submarines in terms no. of their quality. They, uh, and, and most they, of those ghost good submarine designs don't come in and aren't really that available at that time. But you know what the Americans do have at this stage? What? They have the Mark 14 torpedo and yep. the Mark 6 exploder or non-exploder. Which hasn't had, like the British had, a couple of months of testing out their torpedoes and going, this isn't working properly, fix it. Yeah. So, and so we all know also how the Americans react to the knowledge their torpedo isn't working properly. And let's be honest, if, uh, uh, let's say that it's bad enough as it is of the American system. Imagine what it would be like under a fascist system, because let's be honest, if there's one group which aren't good at accepting they've got a problem, it's usually the fascists. Although their own response to their own torpedo issues in Germany's case, it belies that. But the Italian one... No, the, the, the Kriegsmarine was the least fascist organisation within a fascist Germany, um, because it was largely built on a senior officer cadre that was small enough that they couldn't pick and choose the politically reliable ones um, to head it up. So it was headed up by people who actually knew what they were doing. Whereas the German army and then Luftwaffe were big enough that got building up that they could pick and choose politically suitable people who'd achieved a sufficient rank. But, you know, uh, dissecting their politics is not what we're here about. No, if you do want to are interested in dissecting the politics of Luftwaffe, uh, look up. Um, oh, what's her name? Victoria. I've got a colleague who really does this really, really well. Yeah. Let me look at. Uh, I'm Victoria Taylor. She's called uh, her t Twitter tagline is at Spitfire Philly, and she does that amazingly well. And she goes into all the Luftwaffe, and uh, it, it's a complicated scenario, even the Luftwaffe, which are actually arguably more than the Navy is. Yeah. I mean, they're just... Yeah. Um, and the other thing, actually, is we have this myth that the fascist regimes were well organised. They weren't. They were an absolute catastrophe of... Because the way that the fascists stayed in power was that they um, created infighting between departments so that they were too busy fighting each other so they wouldn't actually ever think of fighting up the pyramid. Um, so what you're not going to get is American industry unified and pushed into a, you know, that, that uh, amazing degree of unity that FDR managed to organize with some of the um, chiefs of of the industry um, whose names suddenly escaped me um, which is embarrassing because I've just been reading about all of that stuff in one of the James Holland books but never mm. <laughs> still reading the James Holland book but um, yeah so um, we have uh, oh, what one thing the Americans do have is they on on the Atlantic is they've got cruiser division seven which has got four New Orleans class heavy cruisers and the Wichita they're pretty good cruisers I like them um, looking at them um, and then pretty much all of their destroyers on in the Atlantic squadron are the kind of Clemson and Wicks class of 
you know, World War One vintage, really not very good. Um, the only advantage they've got is that they can't fit the Mark 14 torpedo. So they'll have Mark 10s. Because <laughs> uh, the torpedo tubes were too long, along with the older submarines. Yeah. Um, it's terrible. Yeah. It, it's it's it really is quite rubbish um but the yeah and and then they also have um the submarine base at new london which has got uh it's got some fairly ancient r and s class submarines um i think the most recently built one in that lot is from 1925 these are not submarines you want to be going to war in these are designs from during World War One, and they are small. Mm -hmm. um, and they only have four torpedo tubes firing forwards. So if you're fighting, now that would be fine against a merchant ship. If you're trying to hit a fast-moving cruiser that is going to try and dodge, or a destroyer even that's hunting you down, that is not going to going to be enough of a spread. You'll need more. Yeah. So. And the thing is, the mm. British have designed their submarines with that kind of ambush idea in mind. Hence having up to 10 Ten. Ford Iron Torpedo yeah. Now, I mean, sort of, because I was going through my notes and looking at the various the sort of options. And the thing is, <clears throat> the American Navy is one thing. And I think we can both agree that if they manage to attack, get involved in the fight before Japan's being Japan's main fleet has been defeated, then that's a major problem for the Royal Navy. And I'm not sure how the Royal Navy deals with it. They might fall back on Singapore and their own defences, and the idea that actually the Americans and the Japanese combined would definitely try and come and attack them. So um, if they fall back on their defences, then they have all those the system. They definitely can combine their fast fleet with their slow fleet. You can concentrate your submarines, you can concentrate your defences, yeah. shorten your lines of communications, you've got your land-based air cover, which will have things like hurricanes and um, maybe Wellingtons. Um. But the odds are, I don't see them, unless Japan, America declares what immediately Japan does, which even with uh, a fascist bats. the anti uh, space bats and fascist the anti and space bats I, I i don't see that quite happening no i don't um yeah I, it, it, you have to repair the ground somewhat you have to sort of organize things so i think well if nothing else in february they're all in the caribbean yeah <laughs> having a fleet exercise well, I suppose they could send their fleet off to attack Britain. That would be one way to shorten the war, the big fleet turning up over Britain, because as long yeah. as it didn't have to fight the British fleet, which would be the other side of the world. Unless they send them over before... But if they if they join in before Britain sent... I mean, even if they've sent the Mediterranean fleet before the home fleet's really geared up, Yeah. then that's going to be a fun punch-up, because you've got the home fleet with the Nelson class, mm -hmm. four or five R class, the battle cruiser squadron with Hood and Repulse, renowned, and the two other Q and the two QEs following up. You've got the second cruiser squadron with four town class getting Belfast and uh, Edinburgh in July and August thirty nine. Yeah, in the original commissioning. Squadron. Then they've yeah. already launched. They're already being fitted out. If I'm if I've got a major war coming on again, I'm accelerating them as quickly as I can. Yeah, you've got the um four c class five d class and two hawkins class cruisers in reserve and we know that the royal navy can mobilize reserves pretty quickly yep and those are the ones which aren't on the listings on um uh the websites don't have sort of refit or something else next to their name um so i've i've kind of gone with the minimum number of those mm -hmm. um you've got four destroyer flotillas Sorry, three destroyer flotillas and, and one also tribal flotilla. you've got the French fleet as well, which is probably on our side. You've got the French fleet, you've and got... then there's the fact that again the Germans and the Italians might well. So you might have the Scharnhorst, the Neisenau, which could be 
sort of escorted by some of the Deutschland class. And look, you know, there is always a chance that they can serve, provide brilliant service distracting fire. I mean, the only thing is, what... You they look close enough to a battleship that actually someone could mistake them at range and start firing them as if they are a battleship. Especially if you stick that fake third turret on. Yep. Um, but the other thing about them is, so what what we're dealing with here is actually a very different type of fleet for the most part. And with a few, no, they're, they're both, both sides in this, mm -hmm. Um, Atlantic battle. Now, I reckon, I think, I want to call it the Battle of Argentia. Okay. Um, in, and it's kind of a, the Battle of Jutland that the Americans have been wanting in all their war games because they spent half their time war gaming fighting Japan and mm -hmm. figuring out how to do that and half their time figuring out, figuring out how to fight the British. Uh, apparently. And refighting a Battle of Jutland. And they always thought about Battle of Jutland. Uh, somewhere off sort of Newfoundland or Halifax because we're going to be fundamentally trying to clear a path to bring British forces to Canada, uh, to Canada, possibly with a German expeditionary force and an Italian expeditionary force because Mussolini will want to send them. And the Italians have good Alpine troops. And mm -hmm. this is, once again, the Italians are actually rather good. And the Germans have, have good Alpine troops as well. Yeah. So all you know, the all the soldiers with the Edelweiss on them. Yeah. So you've actually got some pretty good potential there. You know, they 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 have something to contribute, which is ground forces, who then suddenly aren't invading Poland. Mm-hmm. Admittedly, the Italians will need help because when they invade Albania in April 1939, one of their own commanders does point out that. If the Albanians had a decent fire department or fire brigade, they would have been washed back into the ocean. They were so piss poor. But fortunately for them, the Albanians were even worse. Yes. When that's your analysis of your victory. Yes. Uh, but the thing is, let's say mm -hmm. the, that's the reliance on the British going offensive quickly and to defend Canada. They pr would probably have done it, but under that. I think under this scenario again, OK, let's say the Americans do that. I have a feeling the British use the fact that they've got fleets on both sides to their advantage, because if they t they still have the same odds versus the Japanese fleet. So they take out the Japanese fleet. They're then free to come and attack Hawaii and start doing that across the ocean. Now, in this, I'll be honest, I think the Americans are going to split their forces. In which case, I don't see the Americans having much chance on against either. No. But I don't see that they've got a choice because you're you're going to give up New England. You're going to give up New York. No. You're going to you have are... Washington, D.C. burnt down again by a load of Canadians. Yeah. The Canadians do love burning down D.C. It's their, it's their favorite hobby. Yeah. If you ever want to, I mean, if you ever want to make get a load of Canadians very, very proud and wind up a load of Americans, you just uh, shout out the War of eighteen twelve. Yeah, you'll hear a lot of hockey phrases used at that point. I, I think there's going to be some. Uh, it might just well, be my students who are like that, but well, that yeah. that's been my experience. I mean, let, let's be honest: the Canadians are really impressive in World War One, in World War Two. Mm -hmm. everywhere they, this is they, again why i think the american plans for invasion of canada were usually predicated on the fact that the Cana that they were looking at just purely the canadian military formations i'd have gone canada has almost as many guns per head as america does at this time in okay. this, this this and also they have a lot of those people are a lot of those people in the police force etc and around there have served in world war one they are veterans they know yeah. their territory. They know their terrain. You start advancing, you're going to be going up against, well, let's be honest, militias who yeah. are probably going to be organized and led because everyone's going to know who's half decent. So they're yeah. going to be put in charge. It's probably going to be somewhere in the area who was a captain or a major. He's probably going to be he's probably one of the ones who was fighting in, the, you know, in Europe. And they're going to go, Major, you're in charge. Where do you want us? Position them out, self-organized. Yes, you might do the first half days in advance, might be good, but 
after your that. Se- your second day's advance, you're going to be running into these militias ambushing you. Your mm. third day's advance, you're going to have those militias probably being strengthened by some form of regular soldiers. I think one of the fundamental mis- flaws that the, Ameri- that the US seem to predicate any battle with Canada with is they view that they think the Canadians are an oppressed people locked into the British Empire by vast garrison forces rather than the Canadians are just very happy being Canadian. Mm-hmm. And if they wanted to be American, they'd cross the border. But actually, a lot of them cross the border to stop being American or because they didn't want to be citizens of the USA and they wanted to be British or more Canadian that way and Canadian. And so they became Canadians. Mm. Um, and plus, there's the whole Quebecish reason, which, frankly, they don't they're, they're just stubborn. Yeah. They're lovely people. I, I, I love them. I yeah. I, I have oh. many, many Canadian family and all these things. And I have to say they are lovely people, but they are stubborn. The idea that the Canadians are nice people who will give in to anything is completely wrong. They are stubborn. Yeah. They look are stubborn. Hard, look how hard Canadians have always fought mm-hmm. when their homeland is thousands of miles away from anyone shooting. Yep. You're invading their homeland. Yep. And the other thing is, if you invade the Canadian North... And also, uh, if you are the Americans and you're just counting on it just being the men firing back at you, I have some very bad news to tell you. Because in my experience, the ladies of Canada are even more likely to be shooting at you if you're invading their territory than the guys are. In yeah. fact, I think the, the Canadian Armed Forces are testimony to the fact that equality of joining is a very good thing because... Yeah. Yeah. So the American... I, so, so we have I, the US Army... I once had the joy of watching the Canadian ladies hockey t- ice hockey team in, um, in play. And... Uh, yeah, that's left me a lasting impression of Canadian women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, look up the YouTube videos. It'll freak the yeah. hell out of you. Excuse the French. Oh, oh no, no. I had a, I had a Canadian, I had a Canadian lady be a boss uh, for a while, and um, she's lovely. They didn't want to cross her. <laughs> Quite a few inches taller than me. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. The the so because what they've got in the Atlantic is going to be barely a speed bump to the British home fleet. Yeah. Probably even the slightly rumpish home fleet. Except, for, but the other thing, but the the thing which I'm becoming conscious of when I look at the different um, lineups is. There's one thing the Americans don't have. They don't have a single fast battleship at this stage, and they don't have any battle cruisers either. Yeah. So suddenly your Deutschland class have a role in protecting things because their slow speed isn't as bad. Versus the Yanks. Versus the Yanks against things... You know, they, they also the big problem for the Deutschland class and uh, in the entire, entire German war effort in that sort of regards was the fact that you're deploying around the world. They've got nowhere to go to rearm repair. If yeah. you now send them down to South America to support the British uh, to replace some of the British Air Force in the South Atlantic, um, that's fine because they've got the Falklands. They've got Simonstown. They've got all sorts of things they can go into. Well, they're also good for protecting some of your slower assets. So yeah. You can release your fast cruisers your town class can suddenly zoom off um and play maybe with the tribals which is what the royal navy was planning on them doing anyway if the german task force had got out in the, in, yep. in the second world war and there was, uh, conspicuously there was a town class squadron and a two tribal flotillas grouped up very close to each other in the north of england the north of scotland, well, north of scotland and but sort of you stick stick them together they go off um, suddenly America isn't shipping anything down the, west, the East Coast. Um, and, but you, you know, you look at our, you've got the slow British battleships, um, mm-hmm. the R-Class, possibly the Nelson class as well, if it's early enough in the war that they haven't gone out. And you're fine. Deutschland class can, can manoeuvre around them. 
Yep. And add 11 inch guns. And then it's this case of, well, if they're there, they can. They're not necessarily things that, you know, they're going to be quite a good barrier. And I mean, you get this in World of Warships, actually. They're going to act a bit like, um, what's the word? Trumple zones? Yes, basically just people are... Sacrificial armour for yeah, the but... ships, because they're the easy kills. Yeah. Because you can take out some 11-inch guns on things which don't have the armour for it, but, you know, that means you're not shooting at the battleships that are coming at you. The thing is, they're easy enough to take out, but if you don't take them out, they could get into torpedo, etc. range and cause you trouble. Yeah, they're also and they've got 11 inch guns, which if they do get close enough, can cause you trouble. They can cause you, they, the 11 inch guns can cause you trouble, and the 11 inch guns and the 6 inch secondaries can cause trouble for your um, destroyers, trying to cruisers. Get you, cruisers and things like that. Because, mm. you know, what's the other main cruiser type that the Americans have at this stage, it's the Omaha class. Which feels very... Frankly, it feels a sail broadside. Yeah. The, the Omaha class are fun. Uh, they're, they're not in World of Warships. <laughs> no. But, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I, th- I, th- I think... You actually have the potential for a battle that the Americans don't realise how outgraded they are in. And if they've had to... Especially not if they've had to um, politically cleanse the leadership of their navy. Yeah, so they've cleansed themselves of their better senior officers. So let's say Nimitz will have gone, because Nimitz would have definitely been far too moderate. Yeah. You've got... You've got so their battle force has got four divisions of it's got bat div one to four. Those are each comprising three battleships. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the way they're going to organize them. Um, and they've got bat div five in um, uh, in the Atlantic, which they don't even bother trying to keep up with with those. But the question is, where are these ships going to be going? What are you going to do? And I can't see them now. Th- one, a single battleship division is is isn't worth it. Mm-hmm. Isn't worth doing anything about. Um, so the only way I can see them splitting is two on the east coast, two on the west coast, and the east coast ones get the slow bat div five as well for their sins. For their sins. And similarly, you notice what we're not talking about. We're not talking about the, the the Japanese because again, their numbers are so much lower at the moment because of all the ones in refit, refit and repair. That even so the with... Japanese have got the well. Sorry, we're assuming that the Japanese fleet has kind of been sunk by the British. Well, even before that, they've got how many seven, out there? Seven. seven or eight. I mean, they had a total of ten. They had two in reserve going into this sort of thing they would have had two in reserve and one in a massive refit that is not going to be close to finishing i mean it's at the stage i think at this point of engines everything is everywhere engines are out i mean it's Mm -hmm. it's probably that's not a quick rebuild project no that's it's at the stage putting all effort in that's months yeah it's at the stage where you're probably almost faster to build a new battleship (laughs) Close, but not quite. Yeah, you know, it's it's as it's as it's as much a skeleton that once was as you're going to get. Um, yeah, and I just I'm I'm just not sure, um, quite what the Americans are going to do because I just see them struggling. If I'm honest. Um, their best battleships are the Colorado class. Yep. Which are the only ones which have got their, which have got 16 inch guns, not the 16 inch guns of the Iowas, but the 16 inch 45s. Um, 
then everything else is 14 inch except for the lonely wyoming class um which wyoming class is i can never remember i think it's not the wyoming it's the the arkansas Mm -hmm. the arkansas has got 12 inch guns Being 12 inch guns to the party. Well, it, it, it could be friends of the Deutschen Glass. And the Scharnhorst and the Nice Now, except they're going to run rings round, huh? Mm hmm. On that That's note, not a good scenario. No. On that note, do you mind if I go for a quick pee? Go on. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I have stopped and restarted the recording because it just makes it easier for the editing process. Fine. Yeah. But also, you know, uh, one thing was sort of we're talking through this. One thing we haven't addressed in all the scenarios so far is the Dutch war scare, and we did, I think, discuss this address at the beginning, but we weren't going to mention it. But actually, just while we're recording this, a comment has come through from Jeff Beeler okay. on. Part one again. Part one is getting all the cool comments at the moment so far. Please do spread the comments around the other parts. <laughs> I found this pre uh, Jeff Beeler, I found this previously unknown to me complicating factor. January twenty third, Dutch war scare. Admiral William Carnaris of the Abwa leaks some misinformation to the effect that Germany plans to invade the Netherlands in February with the aim of using Dutch airfields to launch a strategic bombing offensive against Britain. The Dutch war scare leads to a major change in British policies towards Europe. It does mean that in February, um, Chamberlain announces the commitment to continental Europe, specifically to France and various other guarantees. Now, the thing is, this then happens a week later, it kicks off a week later in the Far East. January, 9, January the 30th is when Singtao, uh, the Singtao happen. I will be so, completely honest and say, I had not heard of this one. Uh, you haven't heard of this one. I thought we discussed this one. Possibly we discussed some of the things going on in Europe, and I thought I mentioned this one, we didn't. Yeah, but I, 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 think, I don't think it factored into my thinking when I was doing my thinking about all this. So. Uh, well, uh, the, the thing was, when I was thinking about this, you see, the scenario is they make the commitments. Yeah. And that's really important to the French. But if you've got a war already kicking off in the Far East, do you then make those commitments? Or do you change how you phrase those commitments? Or are those commitments contingent upon French support in the war in the Far East? It will. It, it's why I've been saying the whole way through they weren't taking the whole BEF out there. And also why I was pointing out that the Strategic Air Command and the Bombers Force, I think, I'm not sure which part are we talking about this one. I basically said, well, they're going to be staying back there because they're going to be making the claim of defending Europe and they're to countering Europe. Mm. So... I would suggest, I would think you would have a very interesting scenario spending wise, but also there's the fact that a war against Japan, especially a containable war, is what they would view it as to an extent with you know, this scenario, allows them to completely openly take their foot off the broken bird on the gate for all war production going forward. Mm completely openly whilst germany etc is still technically but uh, tied by treaty yes not that germany takes much notice of it I but, you know ever pro- properly goes to a war economy like britain does yes. um yeah the the inefficiencies in the german war machine um why anyone thinks it's so good they they produce some interesting prototypes that's why it's so good yeah. Um, it's um, like the old saying historians have that, uh, well, not all historians, but some historians of my friends, uh, and one of my old professors used to say this quite a lot. Uh, King Louis the, King, no, King Francis of France uh, first was rich on paper, and that impresses historians. King Henry the Seventh was rich in gold that impresses contemporaries on paper mm. 
the paper looks good when you're uh, looking back and going, oh, but look at this wonderful design. Then you look at the reality and go, yes, but. Ooh. Could they operationalize it? No. Yeah. That's their problem. Mm -hmm. Which is also a rather interesting scenario if they are fighting alongside the British versus the Americans. Because they would have very quickly realized the problems with some of their thinking. They'd have had to with the, you know, with, with yeah. what was going on. I mean, they're, they're only allies to this point. Well, allies and bits they've annexed are, OK, they've got the Czech Skoda works, which despite the Skoda jokes of our youth and things, they were very good. Um, but that was about it. They've they've been with the Italians who are not particularly well known for their at the time for re mechanical reliability of things and still aren't necessarily. And the Spanish who've been fighting the Civil War. They haven't worked with another big industrialized country and they've been. Mm. We've they, they've been on the other side from Britain and France for long enough for a couple of generations now. Um, so they don't they haven't seen what British industry could actually do, except from the receiving end of World War One. Um, and I think Which is different. Yeah, I think they'd really I think they would be taking note. Certainly anyone competent on the German side. I think the British would also be taking note about certain things. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing cannon getting fitted to fighters quite quickly. Yep. The the Germans. So the the problem. Um, one of the lovely people on Discord actually pointed me in the direction of, of information on this. The problem with the aircraft cannon that the RAF were trying to get to use was the cold. They were freezing. Yep. Hispano cannon do that. Yeah. The Germans stuck theirs through the middle of the engine. The RA, the British eventually started ducting a little bit of warm air from the radiators or something. But the... Now, the problem is that you kind of have to design that in because the way that the Spitfire and the Hurricane were both designed around the Merlin and then just, you know, beautifully crafted, you know, around that. There isn't the space without a major redesign. But if you've seen them work, they are more likely to figure out why they're not working. And the Spitfire and the Hurricane were always built and were ordered, you know, the, the, the um, request for them included the idea of fitted for but not with cannon to go into the wings. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a novelty. They knew that was the plan. It, and, and that's why they didn't go with the 50 cal or something, because they went, well, we'll go with a shed load of rifle caliber until we can get a cannon. Because that'll yep. work. And there's no point going for a middle ground. Um, and yeah, they might figure it out faster. Theoretically. Theoretically. And anyway, thanks to Jeff yeah. Beeler for raising that uh, uh, yeah. raising that point, because obviously I thought I had discussed it with Daniel, but obviously I hadn't. So that's on well, me. Well, it, it, it hadn't wormed its way into my thinking when I was plotting these before we started recording. But you see, you do have the scenario, and it's kind of like with our answer earlier to um, John Wakeley. You, that is the scenario which exists, and it does. But everything is always subject to context. In the context, Singtown 1939 goes down, and the Royal Navy manages to deter the conflict and save British face. And after the results come in, Neville Chamberlain in the in February makes that promise. Now, does Singtao feature into it? Well, probably, possibly not that specific event because 
It'd I wouldn't be surprised if the Prime Minister's told, but it's, it's, it, the Prime Minister's been told it's made very little hit in the papers because it's been hushed, uh, hushed up nicely. And it, the Admiralty and the Foreign Office can really inform the government we have managed to contain this. Yeah. Japanese haven't responded. They still respect our power. You can afford to focus on Europe. The Far East is stable for now. What we're dealing with is the Japanese. The Far East, contain. not stable. Yeah. yeah. And that changes what happens in Europe. Mm. Because Britain is not about to abandon the empire, which gives its presence in the world. Lightly. Yeah, I mean. I do agree that uh, on my, uh, uh, as part of the combination, if you have got all the fleet heading to the Far East, and as I've, I've already said, I reckon the Royal Na the Navy fighters, the fleet air arm fighters, which are being designed, the fleet air arm aircraft, suddenly get a bump. But I don't think that means that they do a reverse of the Battle of Britain. I think the Battle of Britain aircraft are still getting churned out, probably not in quite the same numbers. It's uh, it's more divided. Instead of going down to five or six types of aircraft, they probably go down to eight or nine types of aircraft. Well, the priority is is your priorities are now divided, but you're also not I'm trying to think because you, you you weren't losing that many aircraft during the the war the first few months of the war no. and you're losing some and you weren't having the factories bombed but fundamentally the factories are currently safe you're not at war with somebody who can attack the factories so you don't need to be setting them up the shadow factories quite as bomb proof for now you might well start sending the shadow factories up but oh, yeah no no you can, I, always I, take, you can take your time a bit more about it yeah and the yeah and i just i think that you've got the options to i i i suppose i can see things developing slightly differently if your war focus is the shooty war in far east not so you know potential for war going off in europe it's kind of the it's that paradigm mm -hmm flip which is which is the fundamental interesting bit about this so you're developing probably two aircraft three for the fleet air arm skewer and its successor sawfish slash albacore slash barracuda but you've you know you basically it's you're building swordfish to an extent probably albacore you are, are developing the Barracuda and you've got a new fighter coming on. And if you think about it, if you've got not doing if you you might crash order the Fulmar, but you also if it's going to sound strange, if that's not if your spit, if your sea fang um, is still being built, Supermarine, which is what I'm using the phrase name for um, the Supermarine navalized gull wing spitfire uh, version of spitfire which was for navy if that's in production you've got that going into production one of the interesting things was that i is i don't think that i think that was built straight with the cannon mix i don't think that was built with the because it was designed to hit they were talking about that they might not have done but i do think what well, i've seen some pictures which had some diagrams which had the cannon so could have I mean, been they had kept, the cannon. They, they kept on trying to get the cannons to work and yeah. I mean, the Spitfire, I can't remember if the Hurricane did or not, already had the radiators going into the wings <laughs> and things. You know, your, your cooling system must have been pretty close to being, to warming those areas enough just by chance, mm -hmm. uh, let alone design. Uh, and it's, you know, I, I think... You have to have your radiators and your guns much more in the... They've got to be in the... You're not going to want to stick them in the foldy, flappy bits of your wing, are you? They're going to be in the stubs. Mm. And I think you still have your mosquitoes and your blenheims. And I think you have your spitfires. Western and world? I think, 
to get your character. Bear in mind, you're fighting with the Germans, not against the Germans. You so the idea of the um, Zestora destroyer heavy fighter hasn't been completely kiboshed yet. No. I mean, for goodness sake, when I was looking through all this, as late as 1941 for Crete, they were still designating Blenheim squadrons as fighters. Yes, and of course, in 19... Well, the the Blenheim's made up a huge percentage of the fighter force deployed at Singapore. Yeah. Ble- I mean, it's, it's... Yeah, we'll leave that to one side. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me, I'm just off in my Bolton Pool Defiant to go and bomb Germany in a strategic manner. Yeah. I mean, talk about using so, the, wrong air, the aircraft for the wrong thing. Um, there, there were, you know, and this is the fun thing. We've got these ideas that have been floating around that haven't yet been knocked down. And they're knocked down by the context of what happens. Yep. That is what... You see, one of the interesting things about looking at this sort of history and looking at it from the perspective we're doing, we're looking at all the variations of history as they can happen. But also, we're going we're trying to keep as close as we can to sort of what realistically would happen. But what we've we've just changed in many ways the order of the war. Yeah. And I think it, again, it's it's the January nineteen thirty nine paradox, as I said. The world history thickens in January 1939. There are so many different things. There are flashpoints in Europe. There are flashpoints in the Far East. And you can go with either one. And it's the perception the British have after the Singh Tauntan because of the way it goes is that they have a handle on what's going on in the Far East. That is what they believe. They have it stabilised. That, and that will be reinforced by the SMMR incident in 1940, in January 1940, when they will think they have it stabilised. And then, of course, December 1940 comes and passes, that's OK. But December 1941, yeah, yowza. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a good time that, you know, Britain is not having a good war at this point. Um, you know, 1941... Britain is looking, Britain may be looking surprisingly ropey. Yeah. Um, quite how ropey things actually are, I'm not sure. Um, There's a lot of things which are ropey, but the thing is, it's going to sound strange. You have to remember is that when are the decisions made? Mm. And what what kind of war, what have they had to do? And what they had decisions had to be made to fight the war they're fighting? And the big problem you had, and I, was, uh, I always think this, that if I was going to make a big change in ship design in World War One, at the end of World War, I, it would be the E-class cruisers would come out with all double turrets, and they would have three to four of them and some four-inch gun, double four-inch guns. Which there were ideas wandering around for them, and that would have been that that would have been how I'd have done it. I mean, um, why, but the why, big decision I would have made in the 1930s would have been sloop construction because the Royal Navy could have built as many as they wanted. But the trouble is, they couldn't build them and get the funding for the cruisers and the warships they have or battleships they needed to build because you need them long term. What I wouldn't have done is order the Dido class or the Crown Colonies. I'd have gone for the Town Plus. Yes. Because, and I don't. 100% see the justification because I think that the naval treaties by that point were by the time they were actually being ordered and were beyond the point of being changed they were not so far along that you couldn't have well it's kind of like the KGVs they're being ordered in the hope in the yeah. hope that I mean, what you can salvage the treaties the KGB hope is you can maintain the treaties, which yeah. is considered this sort of this thing which is preserved peace. And that's the other thing which I find a scenario. I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, right then, I'm now going to set up the next one. And I think that one will be shorter, but we'll have a bit of a summary on. So thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed. And I'm going to quickly disappear before this becomes a full hour.